I am honored to introduce Ju uh, Judith Viors to all of you. Judith is a writer and journalist who works across genres, including uh, science, psychology, children's literature, and poetry. She has written many books, including her age-related poetry ser series that started with It's Hard to Be Hip Over 30, and then continuing through to Unexpectedly 80. This evening, she's going to talk about the new book in her series, Nearing 90. Now nearing her 90th year, Judith Viorst has written another profound addition to her illustrated poetry series on age. With her trademark wit and humor, Judith shares the complicated joys and tribulations of her impending life as a nonagenarian. Anne Lamott, award-winning writer and novelist, calls the book just lovely, sometimes laugh out loud funny, often touching, always wise and real. Everyone, let us all welcome Judith Viorst. Well, God, thank you all for coming. I'm overwhelmed and enormously touched. You can't hear me, that's terrible. How about now? Okay, thank you, Josh. Okay, does this do it? All the way back? Then let me say hello again. And thank you for coming. Nearing 90 is the uh, seventh in my series of decade poetry books which began way back in the 1960s with It's Hard to Be Hip Over 30. Um, I want to start by telling you that the poems in all of these books in no way, no way, resemble the writings of the poets I revere, who are Auden, Dickinson, Eliot, Hopkins, and Yeats. But I decided that somebody had to be writing about saggy kneecaps and Metamucil, so why not me? <laughs> I'll be reading some of my new poems tonight, tucked into a little talk about what might help us be happier in late life. And just to give you a two minute summary, laughing helps. I've, I've always found some things to laugh about in each of my decade books and in each of my decades. Sometimes at the time these things were happening, more usually in retrospect, after the fact. After I'd bitched and moaned and weeped and wailed and tried but failed to waste away. Um, eventually, somehow, after some weeks, months, years sometimes, I could find myself suddenly laughing at what seemed at the moment to be apocalypse now. But the losses of life uh, increase as we get older, and the laughter may be harder to mobilize. Indeed, when I talked to my publisher about my 90s book, I was gently but firmly advised uh, to write a book that he, who was my kid's age, could give to his mother and father, who are my age, a book, though he didn't put it quite this way, that wasn't going to depress the living hell out of them. <laughs> now, he wasn't asking me to deny the tough truths of this time of life. He was simply expressing the hope that I could come up with some hopeful, maybe some cheerful poems about what are misleadingly called the golden years, which in fact are not always that golden. For the truth is that there's a lot, a lot to complain about in late life if that's what you want to be doing with your time. <laughs> Beginning with the aches and pains, um, the diseases and disabilities that assail the aging, aging, actually aged body. One of my mother's favorite sayings when I was growing up, maybe it's every Jewish mother's favorite saying was, as long as you have your health. Now, as a young woman, I thought that was the most pathetic, pitiful <laughs> saying I'd ever heard. That's your standard for what's a good life? That's really what you're aspiring to, your health? Now, every time my husband Milton and I clink a glass of wine together, we have the same toast, Lahaya to health, which is not feeling one bit pitiful anymore. <laughs> I wrote a poem from my 90s book that was all about our doctors and our ailments, but
but decided to cut it because it went on and on. <laughs> so the only references you'll be encountering in this book um, are to uh, hearing loss, diminished eyesight, hernia operations, prostate problems, <laughs> lower back pain, knee replacements, hip replacements, insomnia, palpitations, I'm, I'm almost ending now, <laughs> dementia and death. Actually, there are about four or five poems in this book on death. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you one right now and we'll get death over with. <laughs> this one is called A Warning or Maybe a Love Song to My Husband. Each morning I get up before you and stand by the side of the bed. I'm checking your chest to make sure you are breathing. <laughs> Still breathing, not dead. The reason I worry about you is widowhood's not my plan B. I don't intend living without you, so don't you dare die before me. Of course you're a pain in the ass, dear. Go show me a husband who's not. But on all the others, I'll pass, dear, and stick with the guy that I've got. And yes, we have what are called issues, not always resolved peaceably. But spare me the tears and the tissues. Don't you dare die before me. My words aren't meant to disparage those ladies who live on their own. But after six decades of marriage, I'd rather not go it alone. The sentiment here may not thrill you, but listen, my love, carefully. Keep staying alive or I'll kill you. <laughs> Don't you dare die before me. I'm not kidding either. <laughs> um, each of my poems in 90 is preceded by an epigraph, a few words of wisdom gleaned from everybody from Winnie the Pooh to Albert Einstein. And the book itself is introduced with a quote that I am particularly fond of and that speaks to the way I try, not always succeed, but always try to manage late life. The quote is from George Santayana who says this, to be interested in the changing seasons is a happier state of mind than to be hopelessly in love with spring. Let me say that again, I love it. To be interested in the changing seasons is a happier state of mind than to be hopelessly in love with spring. So uh, hello winter. And what helps make life interesting better more satisfying, happier at this chilly season of the year. A season when we're selling beloved homes and moving into retirement communities where we find ourselves surrounded by all these old people. A season when before we tell a joke, we need to make sure we still remember the punchline. A season when the TV comics tell us our backs are going out more often than we are. A season when, and this no one has to tell us, we're listening to lots more eulogies and symphonies. On the other hand, researchers tell us about, and maybe you've you probably heard about this intriguing phenomenon called the happiness curve, which these researchers tell us is the same across all kinds of income levels and cultures, so it's not just for rich people. It's a U-shaped curve which shows that happiness is to be highest, at the highest point early in childhood, then slowly moves down and down as we grow older, slowly curving upward as we head toward old age, and hitting the next peak of happiness when we are old. Presenting us with an unexpected, completely astonishing finding that after the years of childhood are over and done, we next reach the peak of happiness in our old age. The theory seems to be that uh, the creating and maintaining of an adult life is a lot of responsibility, stress, and hard work, all of which simmer down as we get older. Ambition is tamed, expectations are drastically modified, we've experienced plenty of sorrow, shocks and hard times, and we've learned we can survive what life dishes out 
So here we are in late life, taking a look at our life and thinking, you know, it's pretty damn good after all. Suggesting that the fact of getting old may help us to have a happier old age. Along with a boost from the happiness curve, we also have been hearing that happiness is a choice that we can make. A proposition I'm willing within certain limits, and let me stipulate plenty of limits, a proposition I'm willing um, to sort of agree with. For, you know, because it's easy, it's easy in late life to get our feelings hurt, to feel marginalized, neglected, passed over, left out. Our daughter-in-law isn't calling us to go shopping. Our grandson would rather play soccer than go to the movies with us. Uh, CNN isn't asking for our opinions. And if we become a widow, there are fewer and fewer dinner parties we're invited to. Widowers are a whole other story, but I won't be getting into that tonight. <laughs> Now, we could take umbrage at all of this, go off to sulk in our tents, and wait for the world to come knocking at our door. Or we could take the initiative, make phone calls, make arrangements, dinner, a life, and actively pursue activities that could add up to what we call happiness. Now, for that, you need something of a positive attitude, and I've got a poem about that, which is called Attitude. Once upon a time I flirted, smooth of skin, long-haired, tight-skirted, never satisfied with what I got. Foolish choices, duds I dated, bad vacations, jobs I hated. What did I complain about? A lot. Once upon a time I twinkled, now I'm achy, creaky, crinkled. Also, slow down, sidelined, out of touch. No stroke, no chemotherapy, and as of now, dementia-free. What's there to complain about? Not much. Another, another important quality in achieving a good old age, one of which almost everyone seems to agree on, is becoming better at living in the moment and learning to take pleasure in the ordinary pleasures of everyday life. Uh, of course, we should cherish all memories, but not exclusively dwell in the past. And we need to prepare with wills and directors for what is going to come, but we needn't brood anxiously about the future. And unlike our kids and our grandchildren, we needn't always be out of touch with earbuds and iPhones sealing off the universe. We could do, we could all do a lot more listening to and looking at wherever we're at and wherever the time is right now. Nor do what we look at have to uh, qualify as age appropriate. Um, like a lot of older women, um, what holds my gaze is not restricted to pussycats and waterfalls and babies. I've got a poem called Man Mowing the Grass. <laughs> Maybe you haven't noticed that bare-chested fellow, that flat-bellied, slim-waisted fellow mowing the grass. The one with the black curly hair and the tattooed shoulder and the low slung blue jeans lovingly molding his ass. <laughs> He's bobbing his head to the music that streams through his earbuds. He's mouthing the words to some seethingly sensual song. You think I'm out here on the porch just reading my novel? <laughs> you are so wrong. <laughs> While the, our here and now need not be <clears throat> anyone else's here and now, and while we needn't conform to anyone else's definition of what is age appropriate, we probably shouldn't be kidding ourselves into believing that, in actual fact, we're not really old. The writer Ursula Gwynn once said something to the effect, 
If you're 90 years old and you think you're 45, you'll have a really hard time getting out of the bathtub. <laughs> Nearing 90 is easier with grab bars. It's also maybe easier with a pacemaker or a walker or with one of those things we're supposed to wear around our neck where if you fall down, you push a button and someone comes to rescue you. Our, our beloved president, that's FDR I'm talking about, <laughs> once, once famously told the nation that the only thing to fear was fear itself. But the crowd that I hang out with has a bigger fear than that the fear of icy pavements, area rugs, loose wires, random cats, and stepladders over or from which we might trip, slip, stumble, tumble, fall down. I can unequivocally state that we'll all have a happier old age if we don't fall down. Though, though we may miss walking briskly and running heedlessly upstairs without holding the banisters, that isn't where our life is at anymore. Nor does our marriage, if we're still married, very much resemble the one we embarked on some 60 years ago. But just as this is the life we now have, this is, for better or worse, the marriage we've got. And here on that subject, a poem called At the Japanese Restaurant. They are sitting side by side, not across from each other. The better to lean, dissolve, melt into each other. Hands lingering, eyes lingering on each other as they whisper, listen, nod, smile, laugh, and sigh and taste the offerings from each other's plate. So in love, so newly in love, so wildly in love. He is tucking a strand of hair behind her ear she is running a finger across his lower lip. Hip pressed to each other's hip, they sip their wine, already hopelessly intoxicated. Hello, young lovers, we remember you. Remember the feverish thrill of being you. And find ourselves surprisingly contented with where the years have brought us, with not being crazed with love lovers anymore. But an old, old married couple here on the further, calmer shores of love, sharing along with sashimi and a California roll, a hot and sour, sweet and spicy life. The, the quote that precedes this poem is from Daphne du Maurier, who writes, I am glad it cannot happen twice, the fever of young love. Well, sigh wistfully, if you will, but I think she's proposing, like Santiana, that it's better for us if we don't love only spring. And I'd add that redefining love to suit late life's realities is another way to make a better late life. So is becoming less judgmental and more tolerant of the people in our life and hoping that they'll do the same for us having faced the fact that we're sometimes, sometimes, just as annoying and difficult as they are. It's tempting to add up the failures and flaws of others and compare them to our far superior selves, but we are making a big mistake if we do. Because while they're all on occasion, great big pains in the butt, we are too and we should never forget it. Um, I have a poem called The Graduation Brunch about some of these difficult people in our life. It's introduced by the words of Albert Einstein, who says, rejoice with your family in the beautiful land of life. Try to keep that in mind while I read this poem. <laughs> There's the vegan, the vegetarian, <laughs> the kosher, the gluten-free, the one who's allergic to peanuts, the one who's allergic to shellfish, and the one who shouldn't be next to her former husband's wife, who shouldn't be next to her husband's ex-in-laws. There's also the one on antidepressants, the one on probation, 
The hyperactive twins whose parents were told no kids were invited but brought them anyway. <laughs> the cousin who's suing his cousin over a real estate deal gone bad. The cousin who is countersuing that cousin. <laughs> the aunt describing in vivid detail her hernia operation to the uncle with plenty to say about his prostate. <laughs> and the graduate who's on the back porch ingesting something he shouldn't be ingesting. There's also the one who converses only with his iPhone, the one who converses only about the Dow, the one in recovery sharing her life story, the one in roofing handing out business cards, the sister who's conspicuously engaged in make-out activities with her new girlfriend, the brother who's calling everyone who didn't vote for his candidate morally bankrupt, the mystery guest who has finished his fourth Bloody Mary and is working his way through his seventh mini quiche, and the grandparents of the graduate who are old enough to know that the only response to all of this is rejoice. <laughs> well, also uh, to heighten happiness in late life, there's mentoring, guiding, encouraging, being of help to the younger generations, which is not only good for them, but warms our heart. You know, for, here we are, we're all so experienced, full of knowledge. We have all this wisdom to impart. And are our children asking for it? No way. You know, but there are other people's children, other people's <laughs> children who actually want it and need it and thank us for it. And that is very sweet. We can also enjoy late life by doing something that lies outside our comfort zone saying yes to the new and unfamiliar, trying something that broadens our horizon, taking on something that challenges us, even offers a modest sense of adventure. Now, I'm, I'm not talking anything risky or exotic, nothing involving chasms or snakes. I'm not even proposing something that takes you too far from a bathroom or a doctor. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking more along the lines of taking a tango lesson or a singing lesson or going, signing up at Ollie for a course on black holes. Or you could even not go any further than to your local playground. And I've got a poem about that. This is called At the Playground. And it begins with a mysterious quote from Michael Jordan. Play, have fun, enjoy the game. That woman in the sundress and the sneakers, that woman with a hearing aid in her ear, that short of breath, red of face woman who is running here and there in the heavily humid 90 plus degree heat, that woman who is somehow evading a skinny 12 year old boy and another who is going on 14 as she sweatily dribbles the basketball to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right again, that woman who, though in urgent need of an air-conditioned room and a glass of iced tea, now aims and jumps and fails to make the shot. Her signature underhand, nowhere near the net shot, which brings her personal best to zero, 15. <laughs> that fool-for-love woman who recklessly said yes to her two grandsons when they begged her to go to the playground with them to shoot hoops. That would be me. Another, another source of happiness is giving a little thought to what we want as our legacy. Although that may seem grandiose, it may seem grandiose to be thinking about what we'd like to be remembered for, um, it does have the advantage of focusing our mind, reminding us what we take pride in and what we wish we'd done better and what we might still be able to do. I've got a poem called My Legacy. Since it's looking as if my legacy isn't shaping up to be peace on earth and universal health care, <laughs> here's what I'm hoping to be remembered for. Showing up when I say I'm showing up. Sticking with what I started until it's done. Sending valentines to all the children in our family until they reach the age of 21. <laughs> and never, ever leaving the house without eyeliner. Playing a relentless game of Scrabble, keeping the secrets I promised I would keep, 
being able to laugh about the bad things that happened to me, though not before I first whine and weep and rail against my fate and blame my husband. Doing work I'm able to be proud of, making a truly transcendent matzo ball, coming to terms with mortality, though to be perfectly honest, I'm still not feeling all that thrilled about dying, coming to terms with not feeling thrilled about dying, watching over the people that I love, grateful they're watching over me as well, enjoying whatever there is to enjoy until that final time's up closing bell and hoping just a reminder that I'll be remembered. Well, in thinking about and reading about what helps to make for a happier late life, um, I'd like to offer two final propositions. The first one is counterintuitive. We need to give ourselves time to acknowledge and mourn the losses that come with age. And then, and then, and this is maybe the hardest challenge of all, uh, not let those mournful realities, these tough truths, poison the dwindling precious days of our life. And then on top of that, not getting too operatic about those dwindling precious days of our life. So I've got a poem about that. It's called Lunch with Shirley and You Shirley's. In the audience, you know who you are. So sometimes I wake in the morning and I'm thinking that this could turn out to be my last day on earth. So I better start savoring every precious moment, every single precious, blessed moment, each and every relentlessly precious, relentlessly <laughs> blessed moment of what could turn out to be my last day on earth. This is very exhausting. So I'm thinking today I'll just have lunch with Shirley and we'll share the Caesar salad and the shrimp and talk through our decaf espressos about everything and nothing, nothing and everything. Our marriages, thinning hair, gun control, the grandchildren, how many times we get up to pee at night, the coming election, our book club selection, whether this lipstick's too bright, and does eating a pickle really help with leg cramps? We'll bitch a little and laugh a lot and gossip more than we should, trusting there's nothing it isn't safe to say. And I'm thinking that lunch with Shirley on an ordinary day would not be a bad way to spend my last day on earth. Um, thank you. And finally, we need to mobilize whatever we can and as quickly as we can a sense of humor. We really desperately need to get through the darker days, a sense of humor. In nearing 90 in both my life and my poems, humor has been my salvation, my survival mechanism, helping me to see that when bad things happen to me, they probably aren't, probably aren't the end of the world. I'm gonna close this talk with a poem called What Happened? It's actually the first poem of my book, and it's meant to set the tone. Though remember, I never laughed when this stuff happened. It's meant to set the tone for what, in late life, can still be called comedy, not tragedy. Here's what happened. So while I was writing thank you notes for the guest towels, the fondue forks, and the other wedding presents, and while I was mastering Julia's Coco Van, and while I was discovering that I had married a man who didn't believe in entering checks in a checkbook, <laughs> and while we were disagreeing about the cost of the couch, the color of the kitchen being late, and the frequency of sex, and while we were having babies who immediately transformed us into besotted parents and sleep-deprived wrecks, so much for sex, and while I was doing carpools and station wagons and polyester while beaded bell-bottom swingers were having a ball, and while I was being wifely, maternal, professional, and political and wondering what was so great about having it all, and while he was asking would it really kill me to be nice to his cousin Arnie, to which my honest answer was yes it would. 
And while I was asking whether, when he went overnight to Boston and didn't phone me, he was up to his ears in work or up to no good. And while I was going through my what's the meaning of it all, after all, midlife crisis, resolved with some therapy and an eyelid lift, and while we were deciding if we were ready to make the shift from ski vacations to Caribbean cruises, and while when the children were grown up and gone and he had finally retired and we were for better or worse alone at last, and while as the years sped past we found ourselves listening to more eulogies and symphonies, and while I drove him to specialists and he drove me to specialists so we kept each other warm when it was cold, what happened was we got oldish, then older, then even older than that, and then we got old. Thank you. So I'm now prepared to answer questions. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. I'm a local college student, and when I was in elementary school, you came and spoke at the school that I attended. Um, what school was that? Um, it was... Um, um, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, okay. but it was in. But I think it was in Washington D.C. Okay. Um, I spoke at Janney a lot. Maybe it was at Janney. Go ahead. Um, I've had the opportunity to write. I've had the oppor I've had numerous opportunities to write over the years, and I'm seriously considering doing writing professionally in some form after after completing my studies. And my um and here I just want you to know that hearing the hearing you speak really had a significant imp has had a significant impact on me throughout my journey. And my question is, what do you think is particularly important? What do you want people to know in particular? What do you think is particularly important to know about about how writing can be used to communicate? Well, I think the most important thing about writing to communicate is write. And to be absolutely persistent when everybody turns you down. I started writing when I was seven and sending out when I was seven and I never got anything published until my 30s. The most important thing about being a writer is write. There's nothing better I can tell you than that. Judy, I actually have another writer's question. So I'm curious because I'm working on a book 10 years after my last book and I'm feeling the difference somewhere in time. I'm wondering, can you uh, speak at all to what it's like writing this volume versus you know, one, two or three decades ago? Well, I, it, took me a, it took me a long time to feel uh, reasonably confident that a publisher was going to accept what I wrote. Because um, when, I, when I wrote my first book of poems, and it had very nice reviews, the second one was rejected by my editor. Um, and then when that one was rejected, um, I was writing some children's books, and um, Alexander and the Terrible Horrible No Good Very Bad Day, it was rejected by my publisher, and I had to go to another publisher. And... Um, when I wrote The Tenth Good Thing About Barney, which was a book about a little boy learning about death, that was rejected. And a book that was very successful uh, that I wrote called Necessary Losses, um, I had to fight like a demon to get that published because everybody said, oh, you write these cute little poems and you write these children's books. Why are you sticking your neck out? Why don't you just write one chapter and, instead of writing a whole, a whole book? By the time I got to 90, I thought, even though it was 90, my publisher was probably going to take it. But it took a long time, Josh, a long time to feel secure. Yes? I think I might need to lower this. Thank you. Um, OK. Um, I left you a present, and I thought I should explain it. I spent most of my career working with kids with learning disabilities of various sorts, including autism. 
and I have two of my own kids and myself who also have those kind of issues. And I, and as an avocation, I wrote music. So I wrote a song called Just a Little Bit of ADD. <laughs> and it was based on your character, Alex. So I put it in an envelope. Oh, well, thank you, you very see. much. Yeah, I'm was, sorry, Alexander isn't good. here. Thank you. Ma'am, was there an event or an epiphany in your life that led you into this subject area? And I can't thank you enough for the presentation this evening. This is the subject area of writing decade books. Decade, yes, yeah. about aging. And about aging. From I, hip I, to this, right? Yeah, I, I hadn't actually, I'd ne I had never intended to write decade books. I wrote It's Hard to Be Hip Over 30. And then um, I wrote something called People and Other Aggravations. And I wrote a book about being 40. And it started getting a little inexorable. And um, I realized that I had, I had, I was able to um, identify as, as, as the years and decades passed on, I was able to identify certain qualities that seemed to characterize each decade, things that I could talk about. And um, so I started thinking very consciously of writing a decade after decade book and realized that unless I died or started to count backward, I was never gonna be able to lie about my age again. <laughs> So no epiphany, just a slow but inevitable trip through the decades. Thank you. Yes. Two, or not questions, but two comments uh, from my uh, 60th uh, medical school reunion last June. I became a Trumpite, uh, not in fake ideas, but in fake numbers when I added 60 to uh, the 25 I was at the time of graduating, now, now plus one. Uh, that, that's the pseudo up story. The, the down one was the first poem I wrote in 30 years. And it ended with the idea of, as you're listening to eulogies, having the thought of how many more before you are deaf to your own. Well, thank you for that cheerful thought. <laughs> <laughs> The Trump fight was the cheerful one. No, yeah, absolutely. No. The idea that Trump would be the cheerful one is very depressing. <laughs> Are there any this more? This is going to be yeah. This is going to be more cheerful. Um, what do you let yourself do now that you didn't let yourself do when you were younger? Um, I'm watching a great many series on television. <laughs> And I'm calling up all my friends and saying, what do you recommend? And I will take later on any recommendations anybody wants to give me. I, uh, I've, just, I've decided that I did not have to be reading Yes all the time to be a fine human being. Yes. So I'd like to pick up on the theme of thank you and your influence. And I'd like to pick up particularly on your personal kindness, as well as the kindness of your public persona. When you published uh, It's Hard to Be Hip Over 30, uh, I sent you a sheaf of poems. This was 1968. That's right. <laughs> you invited me over. You put Leonard Cohen, a new unknown singer, My love. <laughs> on the record player. And you were very kind along the way. And decades later, I would, this prompts a question for me. Uh, I want to reserve it now. <laughs> what is the title of the book about being over 100? <laughs> thank you for the question, and I'll let you know as soon as I figure it out. And thank you for that nice memory. Uh, the only question I have is, uh, in your poems and in almost everything that you've said, it's uh, l linked to reality in terms of what I have felt and what I have done and what I've experienced. Excuse me, closer to the mic, please. Sure. The uh, my question had to do with how uh, remarkable it is that her poems and her uh, stories, et cetera, et cetera, they 
really resonated within my experience. And I was wondering how she was able to do that. I mean, it's reading a lot. It's watching television. It's, were you in the closet watching me? <laughs> no, I didn't mean the closet. <laughs> do you understand? You understand I, under, I understand the question. Well, I spend a lot of time with a lot of wonderful women friends and have over many, many decades. And we tell each other the stories of our lives. And it's amazing um, how many ways in which we share the same lives, no matter no matter what we're doing with them. I think my my favorite, my number one favorite fan letter of my life came some years ago from a woman who wrote, "I am a short, blonde, plump farm woman from Iowa, a Methodist, and I think you are a tall, thin. I love that part." Um, dark-haired Jewish woman from New York, and we live the same life. So I thought, okay, I really love that. So I think I'm finished with the questions. Thank you all very much for coming.